in any life after death or that there is no persistent soul. And in fact, um, this is more in keeping with the Jewish tradition that you've got. Um, they're very strict at interpreting the Torah, and nowhere in the Torah are you going to find uh, a reference to human beings having a soul. Um, even when you read, you know, Adam was a, a living creature, a living soul, um, in the same vein, the Torah also calls dead creatures dead souls. Um, the word that they're using there is nefesh, and it really just means breath or wind. It is the wind of God that is inside you that is animating you. And so when you die, the wind of God returns and is released from your body. The Sadducees uh, welcomed Roman rule. Uh, they were aristocratic. Uh, they controlled the temple. And so they, they enjoyed the Hellenization of Judaism. Now, they were interpreting um, the Torah strictly, and so some of, the, uh, some of the theologies or philosophies that you have coming in from, uh, from the Greeks, they reject, uh, but they were welcoming the culture um, into, into, uh, Judea, into the um, Jewish country. And an example of a uh, Sadducee's theology, we can actually find that in Sirach, um, also known as the win wisdom of Ben Sirah. And basically what this reference is um, talking about is, you know, how the, basically when you live, you just live, and when you die, you die. That there's no afterlife at all. And so you have that, we have that uh, reference there to a, a Sadducees type of theology, um, even in our, our own uh, biblical text. And then finally, we have another group, the Diaspora Jews. These are the Jews that have left um, Palestine, and they are all throughout the, the Roman world here. And the most famous Diaspora Jew is uh, Philo. Philo is really where we get a lot of our information about a Hellenized Judaism. Um, and so the Diaspora Jews were the ones that were extremely Hellenized, they also attempted to harmonize Greek philosophies with the Torah. And so when you're reading Paul, you can see a lot of Greek philosophy in what he's writing. You can see the, the Stoic philosophies. You can see the philosophies of Plato in a lot of what he's saying. And so um, you can see that this was not just Paul. There are a lot of Jews outside of Palestine that were thinking the same thing or very similar things to what Paul was talking about. They also used allegory uh, to interpret the scriptures much like the, the Greeks did to interpret the Homeric epics. Uh, and basically, you know, what that means is, for example, with the creation stories. Philo was writing um, from Alexandria in Egypt that we should interpret the creation stories as allegories, as mythologies um, that didn't really happen but stories that symbolized the human condition and how we can interpret where we're, where we're at as, a, uh, as humanity. Uh, they also developed the understanding and personification of the divine logos. Now, logos is often mistranslated as word. And in fact, when you read the first um, part of the Gospel of John, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Well, it's this divine logos that John is talking about. Um, it is, uh, I would say, better translated as divine reason or divine uh, structure that you've got. And so for these diaspora Jews, they were trying to bring about a theology, a philosophy, in which the personification of the divine was, uh, was personified in this divine logos, this divine reason that you have. And so you can see sort of the theology that this influences on Christianity. It's, um, you know, the word is really, really important in theologies for Christianity. And this is where they get that. They also get it from the Stoics as well. So the modern lens in which we look at Paul. Um, we look at Paul and read Paul as if he's talking to the individual. 
as if he had a, um, a problem of conscience, is the way that Luther puts it, uh, that you know, he's not talking to a large group of people or that salvation and justification are for large groups of people, but rather for individuals with individual piety. Um, and I'm going to, in later slides here, talk about how I don't think that that is Paul's intention for us. But that is the modern lens that has evolved in Christianity. Um, it is the way that a lot of us interpret what Paul is saying. And if you remember from Dr. Egan's lecture, um, you know, faith saves. That's an interpretation of what Paul is saying. And so um, that is the, the individualized salvation that you've got um, from our lens of Paul. Uh, and a fancy word for that is our introspective conscience. Um, and this introspective conscience doesn't really start um, in the Western culture or Western society until around the time of St. Augustine. And so we'll actually be reading St. Augustine's great work of introspective conscience, the Confessions. And we get to see that development in our Western society of this individualization. So this is really where you know, we get our individualized society from. It starts with St. Augustine. Um, another way that we often read Paul, uh, just as an example, um, in Galatians 3.24, uh, it talks about how the law was a pedagogue for us, pointing us to Christ. And the way that we often interpret that is that um, the law was merely a school teacher. It teaches us, to, uh, teaches us towards Christ. It teaches us and moves us towards an understanding of Christ. Um, well, the way Paul, I think, meant that is it is actually sort of a, the word pedagogue um, was used to describe a uh, slave that was a tutor. And the slave actually didn't tutor the children. They were really just a babysitter. And so um, what you have here, I think Paul is saying, is that uh, in the interim, the law was just this tutor, just watching over us. It wasn't pointing us towards Christ, but rather was um, our custodian. And then also we have this huge, huge law gospel antithe antithesis, you know, uh, antithesis. So you've got, you know, the law versus the gospel. You either believe in the law or you believe in the gospel. Um, and that's the way we read Paul. And uh, I don't think Paul was talking about that. Uh, and I'll get into what, uh, in some other slides here, what I do think he was talking about. But that is how we interpret that. And that is the evolution of the theology of Paul that we have in our Western culture. So let's move into Paul and our readings for today. Um, we were supposed to read Romans 9 through 11. And um, if you think about it, uh, I would suggest maybe reading Romans 9 through 11 as a way that you would, um, if you were in Paul's context, uh, he's talking about how you get along with Jews. And so, um, really, this is, Romans is really talking about the dialogue between Gentiles um, and then the Jews and how they can get along, even though they have disparate um, theologies. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, we've heard in some lectures here that Paul was converted to Christianity. Um, and... I don't think he was actually converted, or I don't think Paul thought he was converted from being a Pharisee, from being a Jew, to becoming a Christian. Um, what we have here is that in Paul's theologies, um, other than him persecuting the Christians, there's a continuity in the way that he thinks and writes and um, has his uh, theologies developed. Also, he has an emphasis not on his conversion, but rather on what his mission is. His mission is that of the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, he says that Christ has called him specifically to go out and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And then also we can 